And uh, Jennifer, we're going to turn to you now, uh, and uh, you have the floor uh, to yes. talk about your, your cases. My method, or what I think about when I see a patient with dizziness is, you know, they're coming to my subspecialty practice, and they want to know if it's in or ear. And to me, when I look at the balance system, I think about it as a stool. I say three-legged, but this uh, MOG just happens to have four on it. You know, the brain is the master center of balance, just like it is hearing. And we've got input into the brain from the vestibular system. We've also got a lot from the visual system. You know, you watch a merry-go-round going around and around. You feel kind of sick from it. And proprioceptive, standing on shifting sand, for example, your balance begins to go off. What I have to do is try to figure out, you know, the, the cause of the dizziness, and in particular, if it's vestibular, then find an appropriate treatment. I put here just, you know, some differential diagnosis of dizziness. and. We look at dizziness as either peripheral, which in our world means inner ear, central, meaning the brain, the master balance center here, or systemic, the types of the causes of dizziness, just like the case that was just given a few minutes ago, and you know something that is leading to a symptom but not you know, specifically relating to the inner ear as the target organ of the problem here. And it particularly a challenging problems can occur in the elderly. Uh, they almost all have poor blood supply to the inner ear, same vasculature to the balanced part of the ear, the hearing part. So when they've got presbycusis and problems here in hearing aids, you know their balance system is not being perfused normally. Many of them are on, on multiple medications. You can't really measure the effects of, you know, uh, the hypertension, et cetera, et cetera at such a small uh, level on the blood vessels into the inner ear. Uh, many of them come in having been told they have Meniere's disease or benign positional vertigo or something like that because of chronic dizziness and just doesn't fit the symptom. Fortunately, most cases we're going to see in otology are not the urgent, like life-threatening, got to do something right now. And for those that are, like I have here, they can typically be, the, the cause can be ruled in out pretty quickly with an appropriate imaging study and a good physical examination. Uh, the, you know, is it a brain stem infarct, you know, life-threatening here? Do we have a hemorrhage? Is there a CNS infection? We can pick up again with an exam and more promptly with an imaging study. For the otologic specifically, if they're dizzy, you know, emergently, if they're dizzy with acute otitis media, uh, if they've got otitis media with cholesteatoma and now they're dizzy, those are things that do need to, to have treatment, surgical treatment emergently. But again, physical examination, is the ear draining? Do they... You know, do they have a cholesteatoma, known history, or get an otolaryngologist in to clean it and see if there is a cholesteatoma? The, what's real key for me, uh, like Cliff said earlier, the two things I especially want to know about dizziness is what do you mean by dizziness? You know, are we talking about spinning with vertigo? Are we talking about feeling drunk or imbalanced or whatever? And then I want to know the timing of it. Are we talking about seconds, where we're most likely or more likely, if it's inner ear, going to be relating to something like benign positional vertigo, you know, postural and, and some positional changes will make a difference with it. If it's minutes, then I'm thinking more of a circulatory, circulatory problem or maybe central compensation that's off. When it's hours, and especially if it's spinning, I'm thinking more of Meniere's disease, some forms of migraine or a vestibular high drops. For the most part, other than the viral labyrinthitis, if they've got spinning for days and days, other than an acute viral labyrinthitis or neuronitis, it's probably not going to be inner ear at the cause of this. That, that, and it's pretty typical with the history of acute viral neuronitis with this. They often have hearing loss, or if they don't, severe dizziness. So it'll be for days that gradually get better over a series of several days to a few weeks. And if it's constant imbalance they're having, I'm going to work it up, but uh, chances are less that it's going to turn out to be a primary odor. The other key I want to know is do they have hearing loss? And patients ask all the time, or insurance companies that want to know why we're asking for authorization, why do you need an audiogram when the problem is hearing? The inner ear has that two halves, and what happens with one will often affect the other. If they've got a hearing loss, the pattern of the loss will certainly give a suggestion as to circulatory input into the inner ear. Meniere's disease, uh, high drops, they may not even know they have a hearing loss if it's initially low frequency. So I want to know about that hearing loss with an objective test. And if they're having hearing loss with episodic vertigo, I'm beginning to think of hydropic like Meniere's. If it's hearing loss with continuous over those several days, a few weeks, I'm thinking labyrinthitis. If they don't have hearing loss, then I'm thinking more isolated like 
uh, benign positional vertigo, or again, that vestibular neuronitis simply on the vestibular part of the inner ear. This isn't actually part of my matrix, but I put it up because I saw the list of questions that had already been put in, and there were quite a bit on what about doing the Epley over and over on patients. I put in these next couple of slides simply to answer it that what we'll, I'm sure, talk about benign positional vertigo, but when you have patients that you have that you think have, quote, positional vertigo over and over, they are coming in for Epley's or having to do it, one of the things you want to think of is migraine because there's a much higher incidence of recurrent positional vertigo symptoms in patients with migraines. And I put this diagnosis, it's up there, and if you look down, uh, you know, one of the keys on migraine, they, they generally have a headache or some head discomfort or it may be some type of a, quote, sinus pain, but they have, they, they so frequently with this will have motion-induced dizziness. It may not be spinning, but balance way off. And they, you, you want to ask in those cases with benign positional vertigo over and over, are you, does light bother you? Does loud sound tend to bother you or tend to make you more dizzy? Because you may find that more often than you think. And again, I don't want to belabor the point. I put this, this slide up for the last bullet, which when you have that recurrent benign positional vertigo and you ask about migraines, they may tell you they don't have it. And they'll say, well, I used to have it as a child. And the symptoms may tend to change at one point of life versus another. And our next slide on this, uh, I, I love at this point, you know, I start on a few things, but then want to refer to one of my neurological uh, colleagues for the various medications that are used for migraines, which are of all types of uh, pharmacotherapy. 